session. Uh, so as you all know, emergency neuro, neuro ophthalmology by itself is an emergency topic. So any case or neuro ophthalmic case comes to us is an emergency unless proved otherwise. So among these neuro ophthalmic cases, there are certain specific instances uh, which have to be tackled on an emergent manner, not only to save the life of the patient, not only to, to save the vision of the patient, but also the life of the patient. So we have subdivided this topic into uh, four uh, subtypes uh, on the basis of the presentation of the patient to the ophthalmologist, uh, namely patients presenting with headache, uh, pupillary disorders, extracular motility disorders causing diplopia and nystagmus. So each one of us will be presenting each of these topics in uh, succession. Uh, and we are also honored to have uh, Professor Prem Subramaniam to give his keynote address uh, on uh, transient visual loss. Professor uh, Subramaniam is a professor of ophthalmology, neurology, and uh, neurosurgery at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, Denver. Uh, he specializes in neuroophthalmology and with special interest in the treatment of thyroid eye disease, disorders that cause double vision in adults, as well as orbital and skull-based tumors. So uh, first we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Prem Subramaniam to give his keynote address. Thank you, Mahesh. <clears throat> yeah. So I'll be talking about transient visual loss. And in the context of emergency ophthalmology in particular, I think it's important to ask the question, <clears throat> really, it's transient visual loss. Is your patient having a stroke? Because as Dr. Mahesh Kumar just told you, we are looking not only to protect the vision of our patients, but also their life. <clears throat> transient monocular blindness by definition is painless, sudden vision loss with yeah, black okay, or okay. gray vision that usually occurs for minutes okay. or hours. It really shouldn't okay. last for more than a few hours and resolves completely. And patients typically describe a shade or dark uh -huh. curtain coming over their vision. It may extend from top to bottom or bottom to top. And I'll talk about whether that's important or not. And then the vision loss usually goes away just in the same manner that it came on. It goes away over several seconds usually and then is completely normal after that. So transient monocular blindness that we'll be talking about today results from retinal emboli. And the retinal emboli come up from the internal carotid artery and then enter the ophthalmic artery, finally into the central retinal artery, and obstruct the blood supply to the retina. But we have to remember that the ophthalmic artery is the first branch of the internal carotid artery, which then goes on to supply the entire anterior portion of the brain. So if there is some kind of embolic phenomenon that is leading to transient retinal ischemia, we suspect, we are concerned that it could cause brain ischemia as well. I won't be talking about other causes of transient monocular blindness like retinal vasospasm. Papilledema can give similar symptoms for seconds. Compression by orbital tumor, again, gaze-evoked amaurosis can give vision loss for seconds. There are patients who have idiopathic transient loss of vision. And even though it's not particularly common in India, you still have to remember that transient monocular blindness can be the presenting symptom of giant cell arteritis. We have to keep that in mind in our elderly patients. So I'll be talking about transient monocular blindness from emboli. And really the question we are asking is, is transient monocular blindness the same as hemispheric TIA? In other words, is a patient who has this kind of vision loss having something just like someone who has transient weakness or aphasia or some other neurological deficit? Why is that important? Because the way that we approach patients who have hemispheric TIA has changed a lot over the years. Back in the 90s, the North American Symptomatic Carotid Endarterectomy Study, NASET, looked at the outcomes of a number of patients, uh, over 2,800 with carotid disease and neurological symptoms. 659 had high-grade stenosis. Half of them got medical treatment, half of them got surgery. Two years later, or the two-year analysis showed that patients who had surgery had one-third the number of strokes as patients who had medical treatment only. So this told us that surgical treatment in patients with severe carotid stenosis and symptoms is much better than medicine. So then the question becomes, when should surgery happen? Surgery is good, when should you do it? In the 1990s, initially, the thought was, eh, get it done within six months, that is fine. 
However, a reanalysis of the data showed that the patients who were operated within two weeks actually had the best outcomes, the greatest reduction in stroke risk. And in fact, there was no benefit if you waited more than four months. So now, the US and UK for the past 10 years have had guidelines that in patients who have hemispheric TIA, they, and se of severe carotid stenosis, they should get surgery within 14 days. So much different. And in fact, it may be better to operate even earlier. This graph from a study that was published in the last few years shows that even at seven days after the TIA, 10% of patients will already have had stroke. And there are studies ongoing now to see, should you do surgery within one day or two days of the discovery of this severe carotid stenosis in the setting of symptoms. So we're acting much faster now. It is an emergency to get these patients who have hemispheric TIA to surgery. So then as ophthalmologists, we have to ask ourselves, does transient monocular blindness carry the same risk of hemispheric stroke as cerebral TIA? Do we need to be sending our patients who have these symptoms directly to surgery? So they went back and they looked at those NASA data. I told you there were nearly 2,900 patients. 1,500 or so had hemispheric TIA and 496 had TMB as their presenting symptom. So the outcomes were evaluated in both groups, those with hemispheric TIA and those with transient monocular blindness. What was found? If we look in the ones who had hemispheric TIA, we find that medicine is much better than surgery. Half the risk of stroke in patients who had surgery. Again, hemispheric TIA. But what about the patients who had transient monocular blindness? With medicine, about 10% went on to stroke. With surgery, the risk reduction was minimal, 9.7%. Not much difference between medicine and surgery for patients who had transient monocular blindness. And stroke itself could be either permanent vision loss or hemispheric stroke. And if we look and compare those two groups, the ones whose first symptom was transient vision loss, 30% of them, when they had stroke, it was CRAO or something similar, and they went blind in that eye. We are ophthalmologists, we care about vision, but that vision loss will not kill the patient. It is very serious, we want to prevent it, but it will not kill the patient. Whereas people who had hemispheric TIA, over 90% of their strokes affected their brain and was more likely to leave them with a residual deficit. So all of these data together tell us that transient monocular blindness from an embolic phenomenon can lead to stroke but at least from these data, if we ask ourselves, does transient monocular blindness carry the same risk of hemispheric stroke? The answer is no. But we have changed the way we think about stroke risk stratification. Before, it was purely on the basis of symptoms. We didn't have a good method for seeing what was going on in the brain acutely. Diffusion weighted imaging on MRI lets us see abnormalities in the brain within minutes of ischemia coming into play. And it can differentiate acute from chronic stroke in a way that CT and standard MRI cannot. And it has become the standard, at least in North America, for evaluating patients who have had TIA to see if they have, are having true stroke. TIA does not leave these kinds of bright lesions on diffusion-weighted imaging. Only stroke does that. There's some artifact that can occur, but from the standpoint of what I want you to take away, remember, if there are bright lesions on the diffusion-weighted imaging, that is consistent with stroke. One of the early cases that made a correlation with this was published about four or five years ago, where a patient who had CRAO, as shown in the first frame, fluorescein on the second frame confirms that on the second and third frames. The fourth frame shows you their diffusion-weighted imaging, and the arrows point out bright spots that show that this patient was having stroke at the same time that they had CRAO. So that's, again, permanent vision loss and stroke at the same time. What about transient monocular vision loss and evidence for stroke in the brain from diffusion imaging? A study out of Japan looked at this question. Only 13 patients with transient monocular blindness in their series. Nonetheless, 
21.3% of hemispheric TIA had abnormalities, but over 30% of those 13 patients had evidence for stroke in the brain. So at least the same, probably not greater because of statistics, but not less. So this kind of sensitive imaging is telling us that our patients with traumatic, with, excuse me, transient monocular blindness are having strokes. They're having strokes that we need to detect. So how should we go about doing this? Is something in their symptoms going to help us? Because getting MRI and MRA, I know in India, is going to be a difficult task in your patients. It's expensive. But what, is there anything else that can help you? The answer is maybe. There was a paper published suggesting that in patients who have complete coloring in their vision or complete blackness of their vision, if they have a tunneling of their vision, maybe the vision closes in from above and below and then separates back out from the center to the periphery. All these patterns they described that they say was three to four times higher risk of stroke. The problem there is that 75% of patients in this study had one of these symptoms. So it's not a great differentiator and patients, as you all know, are not necessarily the best at describing their symptoms to us. So what do I think we should do for these patients? We need to determine, in our judgment, if an embolic transient monocular blindness really is the cause of their problem. Rule out giant cell arteritis if necessary, and then when possible, obtain the imaging. If you can't get the imaging, if the patient doesn't want to, do your best to explain to them what the risk is, that there is risk of stroke, there is risk of permanent disability if they have disease that goes unchecked. Because if they are having stroke, they may need urgent carotid surgery in order to protect them from having a debilitating stroke that will impact their life forever. Refer them to a stroke team, to a multi-specialty hospital for further workup and possible treatment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Prem Subramaniam. So, any questions to Dr. Prem? Okay. In the interest of time, maybe we can take questions even at the end. Uh, so, the next, uh, I'll be presenting on patients with symptoms of diplopia. Good afternoon. Uh, one of the important symptoms with which the patients can present to us in an emergency situation is diplopia. I uh, will uh, be showing some four representative cases of uh, emergent situations. Uh, I will not be uh, going into the extensive details of all the different varieties of presentations, but I hope these four cases will be uh, representative of the general presentation of the patients. Uh, the, uh, it was debrided and uh, escar formation. Case 3 is a 2-year-old girl child, sudden onset of abnormal head posture of one week duration. Right head tilt was there, fundus was an early papilledema. You can see the child with a head tilt, any acute sudden head tilt, unless proved otherwise, we will have to neuroimage the patient. Signs of increased uh, intracranial pressure in children. The, page, the child had an arachnoid cyst in the vomis. Any post a tumor can cause compression, acute rise in the uh, intracranial pressure. So, uh, courtesy of our uh, neurosurgeon who gave this uh, photograph after removal of the tumor. The last case is an acute uh, onset of binocular double vision in a 30-year-old woman uh, with the presence of a headache. No history of diabetes or hypertension. And visual acuity is normal, left eye isotropia. Left eye abduction is restricted. Fundus is normal both eyes. So not necessarily abduction being restricted. Even a committed esotropia, acute esotropia in a child, we will have to neuroimage the patient. That is a take-home point that everybody should have. So uh, this patient had acute sixth nerve palsy and sixth nerve is called as the tumor nerve. Third nerve probably the vascular nerve. Fourth nerve is the trauma nerve. Sixth nerve is the tumor nerve unless proved otherwise. Had a, had a compressive uh, element in the cavernous sinus. It was an aneurysm. Aneurysm within the cavernous sinus. Internal carotid artery aneurysm. So in summary, these are the take-home points. An acute extraocular motility disturbance may be an emergency. If it is a third now, look for pupillary involvement. 
pain is not a differentiating factor, but pupil is a differentiating factor. Can rule out compression, acute onset of fourth, fourth nerve palsy in a child or adult, in the absence of trauma or systemic, uh, congenital decompensation ex excluded is an emergency. Any sixth nerve palsy, unless proved otherwise, uh, it's better to neuro image the patient, young patient, old patient in the absence of systemic uh, risk factors. And of course, multiple cranial nerve palsies is an emergency. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So next, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Kausalya to present our series on acute headache. Good afternoon, everybody. Headache is an universal experience, and it is a chief complaint of 20% of the patients seen by neurologists. I'm sure all of us would have had that experience. And differential diagnosis of headache is one of the longest in medicine. So whenever you come across a patient with headache, history is very, very important. Ask about the onset of headache, whether it is acute or gradual. Acute onset headache carries importance, and it is an emergency. And characteristics is also very, very important. An explosive headache or a thunderclap headache carries more importance than a dull headache. Or the, if there is a sudden change in the character of the headache, that also carries much importance. And also ask for previous medical history, such as cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, recent history of delivery. And on examination, general examination is variation of the temporal arteries. Along with that, ocular examination as usual. So these are the few conditions which are uh, considered as emergency in neuro-ophthalmology, which present with, who present with headache. Case of temporal arteritis or uh, patients with intracranial hypertension or painful Horner syndrome. We'll have a few <coughs> case presentations to explain these conditions. So our first patient is a 13-year-old boy. He had headache of two weeks duration. It was a dull, deep, boring headache, and it was associated with vomiting, which, signif uh, which signifies increased intracranial pressure. And he gave history of right eye pain of one week duration, and for two days, he had drooping of the right upper eyelid, along with binocular double vision. So his general physical examination was normal, and uh, his best corrected visual acuity was 6 6 in both eyes. So right eye examination, as shown in the photograph, he had complete ptosis, and his pupil was dilated and fixed. And extraocular movement uh, examination showed restriction of elevation, depression, and adduction. This is the fixed dilated pupil. And here you can see there is complete restriction of elevation, adduction, as well as depression. This fundus, color vision, and central fields were normal. So the final diagnosis is, it is an oculometer nerve palsy. It is a complete third nerve palsy with pupil involvement. As mentioned by Dr. Mahesh Kumar, with pupil involvement means it is an emergency. We have to rule out an aneurysm. The most common expected finding will be a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. So we went ahead with imaging of this patient. Here you can see an aneurysm of the ICA. This is ICA aneurysm of the cavernous part of ICA. I'm sorry, here these pictures are flipped. This is the right side. Here you can see again the aneurysm. The most common cause being vasculitis. It was not a posse communicating uh, artery aneurysm as it was expected. So it is an emergency. Why? If the aneurysm is left alone, it might rupture, leading on to intracranial bleeding, which is a life-threatening condition, as we all know. So the patient was referred to a neurosurgeon, and interventional radiologist also uh, saw the patient, and a DSA was done. And finally, the patient underwent coiling. This is a pre-coiling picture showing the aneurysm. And this is after coiling. The patient is doing well now. This is the x-ray picture showing the coils. Our second patient is a 65-year-old male patient. He complained of persistent deep headache, explosive headache over the left temporal region. And he had local tenderness also in this region. And he gave history of transient visual obscuration for five days duration. And one day before, he had total loss of vision in the same side, in the left side. On examination, his right eye was, uh, had 6-9 vision. The vision in the left eye was hand movements with relative afferent pupillary defect. And this is the fundus finding of the patient. He had a pallid disc edema. 
So the diagnosis is very obvious. And then we went ahead with a general examination. We palpated the superficial temporal artery. The pulsation was absent and there was tenderness also. So straightforward diagnosis is arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. These are the set of investigations needed to be done in any case of AON, whether it is non-arteritic or arteritic. But in case of arteritic, it is an emergency. So do the investigations, but please do not wait for the results. Start IV steroids immediately because it is a medical emergency. Just a word about the thunderclap headache. What is this? This is a severe explosive headache that reaches its maximal intensity in less than one minute and the most common causes being vascular. So it can occur in cases of intracranial artery dissection or cortical venous sinus thrombosis. Our third patient is a case of CVT. Here is a young male with severe headache, neck pain and vomiting with history of transient visual obscuration for 15 days. The patient had severe neck pain so that he had a stooped posture when he entered the OPD. His vision was normal, 6-6 six, six in both eyes. Pupils were normal, color vision also was normal. One positive history he gave was history of polycythemia vera. This was the fundus of the patient, very frightening fundus, very severe uh, papilledema with lot of hemorrhages and exudation. So as a routine, any case of papilledema, we have to do neuroimaging. It is just not MRI. We have to do a MR venogram also to rule out CVT in any case of papilledema. This is a very important point. So we did MRI along with the MRV. Here you can see there is complete thrombosis of the sagittal sinus. There is no flow in the sagittal sinus. So it is a case of papilledema with CVT. So this patient needed urgent treatment. So we referred the patient to a neurophysician. He was heparinized and treated. Our next patient is also a similar case. He is a 38 year old man. He also gave history of headache and defective vision of one week duration, but the vision was 6-6 six, six in both eyes. Though the patient said defective vision, vision was 6-6. Six, six. Pupils were normal, color vision was normal, but the visual fields there was enlarged blind spot. Here is the fundus of the patient. Here again you can see the disc edema. The reason for the defective vision, even though with 6-6 six, six vision was this macular problem. Here you can see a, see a macular star lot of exudates in the macula. So as a routine, we did blood pressure examination because this is not a typical picture of papilledema because in usually in papilledema, these many exudates will not be seen. This edema will be more prominent. So the BP of the patient was 200 by 130. So this is a case of malignant hypertension with grade four hypertensive retinopathy. As we all know, the patient was immediately referred to the physician and renal function tests were done immediately to rule out nephropathy. So how will be the headache due to intracranial hypertension? It will be a progressive worsening headache. It will be worsened by cough, effort or lying down and it will be always associated with nausea and vomiting and sometimes horizontal diplopia and the pain is due to stretching of meninges. Our last patient, she is a young girl with headache, double vision, fever and vomiting with the same characteristics and vision also was 6-6, six, six, color vision normal, only finding was enlarged blind spot as seen here. She had abduction restriction in the left eye, that was the reason for the double vision. So that was uh, left 6 nerve palsy and this is the fundus of the patient with lot of hemorrhages. There is no exudation, not much of exudation. So again, we did the imaging MRI with MRV. We saw a ring enhancing lesion in the right frontal lobe with a lot of meningitis. This is opticochiasmatic arachnoiditis, basal meningitis. So it is a case of tubercloma brain with papilledema with left six nerve palsy. And tubercloma, as, as we all know, it is very common in our country. So patient was referred to the neurophysician immediately. So to summarize, these are the conditions which, uh, who present with headache and need Im immediate attention arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and papilledema, these are the common causes and also grade 4 hypertensive retinopathy due to malignant hypertension. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kausalya. Next, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Padmavati, a consultant neuro-ophthalmology at Aravindya Hospital, Thirunelveli. 
uh, to describe about patients presenting with nystagmus. Uh, at the outset, I'll be talking about. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. Uh, those, before I start my lecture, I would like to say that those patients who present with acute onset of nystagmus should be treated as an emergency and should be investigated. Why do you need, uh, what is the purpose, why do you discuss these emergencies in neuro-ophthalmology? Because they could be, as Dr. Mahesh had said, it could be vision-threatening or life-threatening. It could be associated with your mortality or morbidity. You need a prompt referral and recognition to treat these conditions. So when you see a case of nystagmus, what does, does it diagnose a condition or does it diagnose any disease? No, it gives you a localizing clue what is, where is the site of lesion with associated with other symptoms like headache, diplopia or any gaze restriction that can give you a clue to what is the probable diagnosis and you need to also know the what is the past history of drugs okay just see this young uh, lady who had presented with difficulty in reading if you watch her she has a nystagmus you see a slow up face followed by a down face Okay, I think the diagnosis is obvious. Can anyone give the answer? This is accentuated on extreme gazes. The vision is normal, the fundus is normal. This is a case of downbeat nystagmus. So you know where the lesion is. The lesion is at the pontomedullary junction. So what are the causes of downbeat nystagmus? One is your Arnold-Chari malformation, which is the commonest. Next is your cerebellar degeneration. It could also be secondary to all these MS drugs or idiopathic. So we went ahead with the investigation. We had done an imaging in this child. She was supposed to, she was diagnosed as a case of arnold Cherry malformation type 1. There was, as you see in the arrow mark, there was descent of the cerebellar tonsils below the foramen magnet. What is this arnold Cherry malformation? Why do you consider this as an emergency? Why I would like to say is, when you deal with an Arnold, this is actually a hindbrain disorder where there is descent of tonsils below the foramen magnum. So what, when do you have complication is when there is occurrence of syringomyelia. So there, this was a uh, case study which was reported in 2015. They found in patients with Arnold-Chari malformations of type 1, they found the incidence to be around 30 to 70%. And the management is only surgical where you need a suboccipital craniectomy and foramen magnum decompression. And most of 78% of those who had been operated had improvement, whereas 74% uh, they had improvement over the neurological status. The mortality was 2% in the postoperative patients. Moving on to the case two, this was a 10 months old baby. This baby, the mother noticed shaky eyes of two months duration. The child was able to fix and follow light. The fundus was within normal limits. As such, when you see such a kid, you the first thing you tend to diagnose is, is it a congenital nystagmus? How do you distinguish it is with a congenital? The history is one point where the mother is giving, the patient had acute onset of nystagmus of uh, two months duration. But the general examination provided the clue. There was a pigmented patch over the abdomen, which was diagnostic of a cephalot spot. I think the diagnosis is obvious. You, the patient underwent an imaging, and this is what was seen on the MRI, which was characteristic of an optochiasmatic glioma. So on six months follow-up, uh, the patient was advised actually observation on advice from the neurosurgeon. The tumor had increased in size. It had extended postchiasmal. It also uh, had extended supracellular, also into the hypothalamus with dilated third ventricle. So the tumor had increased in size. Now you see the nystagmus of the baby. I think the characteristic has changed. It is a typical CSA nystagmus which you are seeing now. 
So 70% of the optic pathways glioma is associated with neurofibromatosis 1. This is an autosomal dominant disorder. So as such, these patients, you have to undergo, they have to undergo screening every year till 7 years of age, then every 2 years up to 18 years of age. This, as such, initially presented as a pendular nystagmus, later was seen as a CSA nystagmus. This is characteristic of a parachiasmal or a paracellar lesion. So what is this is a CSA nystagmus. This is because a lesion is in the interstitial nucleus of the kajal. What happens is one eye elevates and entorts, the other eye depresses and extorts. So it is something like how you, you cannot expect similar way as a seesaw movement, but it is the same as that. This is, you have a disjunctive vertical component here. The treatment here is, if it is surgery, if there is an intracranial extension, and chemotherapy, it is if it is less than five years of age. The main of aim of chemotherapy is to delay the use of radiation. And radiation therapy is uh, advised more than five years of age if it will not cause damage to neuropsychological functions. This trial was started on chemotherapy. The initiation of therapy should be delayed until at least two successive ophthalmological examination document visual deterioration or two successive imaging studies shows tumor growth and child has neurological deterioration, which is an imminent danger of blindness. This was an article in the textbook which says, which conditions of optic uh, pathway gliomas have a poor prognosis? These indicate that those in infancy and childhood associated with uh, hypothalamic symptoms, with hydrocephalus, and with posterior extension. This is also supported by this paper where you see here, uh, the acuity, visual acuity loss is seen around in 47% of the patients. They had concluded that the visual loss is dependent on the site of the size of the tumor as well as the extension. That is, postchiasmal extension is more characteristic of visual loss. Moving on to the case, uh, this was a 34-year male who had presented with uh, defective vision and shaky eye movements of few months duration. I think. This is also a classical CSA nystagmus. Yes, this is also a classical CSA nystagmus. And the diagnosis is the lesion is in the paracellar region. And it was a case of pituitary adenoma. But why it is an emergency is the chances of apoplexy, as mentioned earlier, is always there. And the mortality rate associated is around 0.7 to 12.5%. Moving on to my case scenario of fourth case, this was a young girl who presented with blurring of vision. Watch this girl. On attempted up gaze, she has an abnormal eye movement. This is best appreciated. I think this is a case of convergence retraction nystagmus. Unfortunately, I don't have the MRI of this girl. It was a case of uh, pineocytoma, and it was a dorsal midbrain syndrome. Actually, the convergence retraction nystagmus is not a true nystagmus. It is an asynchronous uh, saccades. This is because of a lesion affecting the posterior commissure. Moving on to my case, this was an uh, elderly person who presented with a case uh, with a, uh, double vision and also shaky eye movement. I think this is a case of disso dissociated nystagmus. This is an abducting nystagmus which is seen in the left eye. And you have a right eye which is adduction, uh, sorry, left eye where the adduction is restricted. So you know it is a case of left-sided intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. Okay. And the imaging was uh, diagnostic of a in fact, in the medial longitudinal fasciculus. The next case, watch this video. He has a uh, nystagmus on the right gaze as well as on the left gaze. Note the amplitude as well as the frequency of the nystagmus on the right gaze as well as on the left gaze. When he sees on the right, it is a large amplitude and a low frequency. When he sees on the left, it is a high frequency and low amplitude. I think the diagnosis is obvious. This is a case of Brun's nystagmus. 
the bruns when you have the larger amplitude as well as the uh, low frequency nystagmus it indicates that is the site of lesion whereas your high frequency and large amplitude it indi uh, indicates that it is a because of your uh, defect uh, vestibular ocular uh, involvement watch this patient he has a multiple uh, this is not from our patient this is from the novel uh, virtual library i had just taken this to demonstrate why it is needed if you can see again this is a multiplanar directional movements of the eye this is diagnostic of opsoclanus you have a high frequency oscillation this is because of the disinhibition of the vestigial nucleus what is the red flag here is you have to rule out a paraneoplastic lesions especially in the children if you see you have to rule out a neuroblastoma in an adults you have to rule out a lung or a breast carcinoma the next condition i would like to mention is a spasmus nutans this is seen in less than 1 year or 6 years of life there is a triad of nystagmus as well as head nodding with abnormal head position the scenario the red flag here is always rule out a anterior pathway glioma so you have to image to conclude i would like to say that you have to identify the waveform direction amplitude frequency of the nystagmus you also have to be uh, beware of the warning signs which require urgent attention also correlate with your clinical conditions as well as the clinical uh, uh, signs and symptoms which will aid you in a diagnosis and always neuroimaging is mandatory in all these cases thank you thank you dr padmavati uh, last i would like to invite dr chaitra to our presentation on patient presenting with pupillary disorders good afternoon everyone i'll be speaking on pupillary disorders so clean uh, pupillary light reflex evaluation is of utmost importance which must be coupled with the detailed clinical history and evaluation i will be discussing four cases uh, the first case this is a 25 year old gentleman who came with history of uh, trauma uh, following alleged history of rta trauma on, on the right forehead and he also complained of defective vision on evaluation his vision was uh, defective which is 6 by 60 his color vision was defective uh, fundus evaluation is normal because the disc pallor can take up to 3 uh, 3 to 4 weeks for the pallor to set in the disc and the patient had a right eye rapd uh, so here rapd in efferent lesions rapd is usually seen because of the withdrawal of light from the withdrawal of light from the the dilatation caused by withdrawal of the light from the normal eye outweighs the constriction of the caused by uh, stimulating the abnormal eye in efferent lesions always the pupils are equal in size and uh, because of the decussation of the fibers at the chiasma as well as at the edinga westphal nucleus so the pupillary defects can be classified broadly into efferent and efferent defects efferent defects may be total or relative here like i said the pupils are equal in size whereas in efferent lesions uh, the pup uh, you, the patients will present with anisocoria moving on to the second case this is a 60 year old man who comes to us with dro uh, drooping of the right eyelid since his 5 uh, days he is a non controlled diabetic and a hypertensive his vision visual acuity is 6 by 16 in the right eye and 6 by 36 in the left eye which is explained by the presence of cataracts pupil evaluation revealed the presence of uh, anisocoria anisocoria in the right uh, right eye and he also had a defective uh, severe ptosis in the right eye with defective uh, elevation depression as well as adduction in patient present with third nerve palsy pupil evaluation must be done because if the pupils are involved it uh, it should be invariably considered to be due to the presence of an aneurysm in these patients if the pupil is involved the pupil is usually dilated and fixed to both direct and consensual reflex and also the patients present with the defective accommodation 
the pupillary fibers lie superior medial to the third nerve and they also are supplied by pile blood vessels whereas unlike the third nerve which is supplied by the vaso nervorum so any patient presenting with the pupil involvement in third nerve palsy always rule out a compressive lesion like an aneurysm moving on to anisocoria like i said all patients with efferent pathway lesions present with anisocoria always check for light reflex in dim uh, check for the change in anisocoria in bright light as well as dim light if the anisocoria does not change in dim light or in bright light if it remains the same then the, uh, it you it may be a physiological anisocoria in patients with anisocoria which accentuates in bright light rule out third nerve palsy or an ad's pupil patients presenting with light near dissociation differential diagnosis may be an ad's pupil or an agel robertson pupil uh, or a perinot's dorsal midbrain syndrome in uh, patients presenting with anisocoria which accentuates in dim light rule out a horner syndrome moving on to my third case this is a 30 year old male who uh, who who presented to the uh, to the emergency department with the uh, uh, history of road traffic accident he was comatose but on pupil evaluation uh, pupil was noted to be dilated and fixed and on neuro imaging a subdural hematoma was noted here Uh, the pupil is dilated and fixed on the same side of the uh, because of the presence of an uncle herniation of the temporal lobe which causes uh, through the tentorial notch which causes a compression on the third nerve uh, the pupillary fibers over the third nerve moving on to the fourth case this is a patient who Uh, who presented to the uh, neurophthal department with complaints of mild ptosis in the left eye on pupillary evaluation uh, anisocoria was noted which was seen uh, which was accentuated in dim light so here we can note that there is a uh, anisocoria wherein the left eye seems myotic which is more accentuated in dim light this indicates a sympathetic palsy here the patient usually presents with meiosis partial ptosis of the upper eyelid because of the paralysis of muller's muscle and inverse ptosis of the lower eyelid because of the paralysis of an inferior tarsal muscle facial anhidrosis if the lesion is below the level of the superior cervical ganglion pupillary dilatation lag loss of cilio spinal reflex and conjunctival hyperemia may be seen because of the loss of vasomotor response so a ct chest was performed which indicated the presence of a paravertebral mass uh, moving on to co- patients in coma in in these patients pupillary evaluation is very important because if a patient in coma presents with maybe a sign of uh, uh, maybe with signs of ipsilateral horner syndrome rule out uh, hypothalamus uh, lesion in the hypothalamus pinpoint uh, pupils may indicate uh, opiate poisoning or a pontine lesion in patients with uncle herniation usually uh, dilated uh, pupil is seen in the same side of the lesion bilateral fixed pupil may be seen in uh, severe anoxia however in uh, patients with uh, coma due to metabolic disorders pupil is never involved i would like to conclude by saying that pupil evaluation is very simple and can be done in the most basic clinical setting and uh, it not only helps the clinician to tailor his investigations but also to intervene uh, in life saving emergent conditions thank you thank you dr chaitra so in the interest of uh, time we'll take quick questions two or three questions we have about 2 to 3 minutes left any questions for any of the speakers in any of the conditions trends in obscurations of vision or headache or whatever condition okay so if there are no questions uh, i thank uh, all the speakers my co speakers i thank uh, dr prem subramaniam for giving his keynote address and i thank all the audience here who have been present here to attend this uh, course thank you very much